I'm Steve Soder from Workiva and welcome to this session. Today, you'll get on-the-go perspectives on what high-performing accounting and finance teams are doing differently, and perhaps a forecast of what the future holds. We're gonna have some fun today. As you can tell, I'm getting excited. We're getting close to the holidays. So hopefully this can be a light and interesting conversation. I am delighted to be joined today by Matt Kelly, CEO and founder of Radical Compliance, and Ellen Orednik, the Vice President of Talent at RGP. Well, let's jump right into the content. And, and one of the things that we wanted to ask just right off the bat, it seems like COVID has been a game changer, but it's been an accelerant. And of course, this conversation will include COVID, but it isn't gonna be all about it. So I just wanna get started. What workplace trend do you see having the biggest impact on accounting and finance right now? Seems like a really dynamic environment. So I would say, you know, the project economy really is here to stay and is a really exciting trend that we're tracking. So let me just give you some numbers that I think are really powerful. Um, in the year 2020, 35% of the workforce did some kind of gig work. And by 2027, we're estimating that will be 50% of the workforce. And this is a huge shift for accounting and finance. If you think about the traditional career path for an accounting or finance professional, um, it, it typically didn't include gig work, right? Whereas now we're seeing people come into these roles who are not approaching their career in a traditional ladder step way and are coming at it with project experience, consulting experience, maybe some breaks in their career. Um, so that's a huge shift in terms of how people manage their careers and how employers evaluate and retain talent. Ellen, I'm, I'm curious, what could that look like for an accounting and finance person? And I'll use a really geeky example. I actually enjoy balancing checkbooks. I am a dyed in the wool accountant. I love it. I enjoy it. I've often thought, hey, maybe I could do like some kind of gig bookkeeping or something for a, a small business. Is that Would that be a relevant example of, of maybe this project-based work that accounting and finance folks might be doing right now? Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a great example of people kind of becoming their own business, right? Sometimes it's a side hustle. Sometimes it starts as a side hustle and becomes a full-time uh, gig. But I think that that's a great example. But there are a lot of other examples. You know, I can think of probably three people this week alone that I've talked with who are actually in consulting engagements with their former employer. So maybe they got to a point in their life where they wanted to do something different. They wanted different balance, different control, and their employer still saw value in their skills and experience and said, well, as you transition out of that you know, senior accountant role, I want you to come on as a consultant and help us you know, implement one stream. It's interesting. Matt, you and I have been looking at trends recently. We worked on this big state of the SOX market report for the SOX and internal controls professionals group. I know you've got an opinion and are seeing a lot. What's your perspective on the biggest impact of trends to accounting and finance right now? Well, I mean, I, I would keep it simple that uh, I, a thread very similar to what Ellen was saying is that still the biggest driver of change in work right now is just the push for remote work or hybrid work or something to that effect. Um, maybe a bunch of us will start working in offices again full time in 2022, but I suspect most of us probably won't. I don't know that we'll be all remote all the time, but even if you are largely remote or somewhat hybrid, I think the implications of how work gets done in that environment, like that's the big thing that's driving it. So it would be things that would become more important for an employee to thrive and succeed in that remote world. That's what I would tell people to, to keep thinking about. So it would be project management. Uh, it would be team management and maybe trust skills that you can build in a team when I think that's a lot easier to do when your team is eight or 10 people who are seeing each other every day and they're right next to each other in one department. But if these days they are on five different time zones, maybe in two or three different countries and they're all online, you have to Think about, you know, how am I going to guide all of the deliverables instead of just kind of peering over the cubicle wall to ask Tom or Jim or Joan or whoever for help or what's going on. So the people skills and the management skills that become more important when we're all still largely doing some amount of remote work, like that's what's going to shape 2022 and beyond and probably for quite a number of years beyond. So if we assume that accounting and finance uh, teams kind of figured out, hey, we can actually do this work remote, 
it sounds like what you're saying is, hey, this trend is going to continue. And now what they're going to be looking at is, well, how do we do it better, right? How do we magic products better, projects better? How do we build trust, right? It's, hey, we know we can get the work done. So how do we maximize efficiency and collaboration and all of those good things going forward in the future? It's almost like this new kind of practice or element to sort of emerge, right? Like auditing or doing accounting remotely. Is that right? Yeah, I think part of the challenge is going to be the mechanics of how would you use the technology smartly and how would you assign tasks and how would you maybe use new data technologies better if you're really going to be uh, working across multiple time zones, multiple locations and things like that. I also still think a big part of it is going to be the people skills when the people aren't next to you. And there's a famous quote from George Bernard Shaw. He said, the biggest problem with communication is the mistaken belief that it has happened. And what he meant was that plenty of times people will think they said something and everybody understood it and the other people didn't. And it's easy to make those kind of bad assumptions when we're all chatting on Slack or iMessage or email or something like that. And that's how we're doing it as opposed to just meeting in the conference room. So those, it's a mix of what I think the challenges are. We, uh, this past summer, I, I did a session about digital body language, um, and there's a great book out there about it. But in retrospect, I actually went back and read some of my Slack messages. It's an IM tool that we use at Workiva. I actually sound like a real jerk on Slack, to be totally honest with you. And I, I think I'm generally not a jerk, but sometimes it's pretty curse and, and, and right brief. But I think it's a great point. How do you communicate in the new environment? It's a great point, Matt. And Steve, you know, I sort of pick up on that. You probably, you know, you've probably earned some trust and credibility with those coworkers at Workiva because you've got established relationships. And so the way you communicate when you have those established relationships is very different um, from how you communicate when you are in the process of establishing those relationships. I love it. Um, Let's move on to another question. We've heard a lot about this term lately, the great resignation, right? So many people are leaving jobs. Some are going to different jobs. Some are staying out altogether. Talked about the gig economy thing. That's been a big thing. How do we think about that within the context of accounting and finance professionals? We've done some internal surveys and actually job satisfaction is actually fairly high, fairly, or, or excuse me, higher than we thought it would be. But I'm wondering, how do we see the great resignation affecting accounting and finance professionals today? Steve, I see it uh, affecting it probably in a couple of different ways that are somewhat good and somewhat bad. Um, for an individual person who is good at their job and has good skills, I mean, look, let's be honest. How does it affect you? You can demand more money. You can demand more interesting assignments and you could go and even not necessarily say, I don't like this co this company, I'm going to quit, but more like, look, I'm getting calls from recruiters four times a day. I have to do what's right for me. Please pay me more money and give me more interesting assignments so I'll stay. And that is, it's not part of the great resignation because nobody's quitting in that circumstance, but it is the great demand or something like that. So at an individual level, I think a lot of uh, ANF people would probably find that this is not such a bad thing for them. On the other hand, I also think that the great resignation creates a lot of what I'll call froth in the workforce. There are a lot of people who are coming and going. And even if you are staying where you are, if your colleagues or people down the hall or another business department that your accounting team works with closely, if they're experiencing a lot of high turnover, that doesn't do the organization any favors. But one of the things that I've noticed is the pay that is being offered for some of these positions. I look at where I started out just coming straight out of accounting school and now comparing that to what other people, the big jump is you know two or three years into your career being able to like, let's say get out of public accounting, for example, and get a job. I mean, those salaries are massive, uh, at least relatively speaking to what they were. I wonder if that's this other element that may have longer term impacts on the practice in general. Again, I don't know if you have any comments. I'm probably pulling that out of left field a little bit. But the whole compensation piece um, is, I think, been really, really dramatic just in terms of what's happened over the last even several years, perhaps before COVID. No, I, I think that's a very valid point. And I don't have any data uh, to my knowledge and I can't pull it out off the top of my head. But it's absolutely true that um, internal salary disparities, whatever we might want to say that, you know, that maybe somebody who is now newly hired is not 
20% under the mid-career people. They're 2% under the mid-career people. That's going to create some tensions. And, uh, you know, there are going to be ripple on effects that more senior managers in the HR department, like they're going to have to think that through. Um, and that's just the salary. You could say the same sort of thing for interesting work uh, or projects that will enhance somebody's LinkedIn profile when they try and buff up their, their profile. Like all of that stuff is going to wind up being things that more senior leaders, you're going to have to confront and think about. Well, I appreciate that insight. Ellen, yeah, please jump in. I was just going to point out to our audience, you actually wrote a terrific article about this for the SEC professionals group. You can find it on the LinkedIn page. I know you've got some great insights. Again, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I just wanted to share anecdotally, I don't have hard data either, but uh, we track this, you know, just in terms of our own workforce, which is fairly sizable at RGP. And as people are making moves, um, both people who might be leaving our team or people we're talking with in a recruiting capacity, we're hearing that for high demand skill sets, it's not out of the question to see a 20 to 30% increase when accepting a new role. So that's just a, a data point in terms of the compensation piece and what we're seeing. Um, and then we also see that compression that Matt was talking about, right? Where maybe there was a $50,000 spread between a manager and a staff level accountant. And now that's much smaller. Um, now maybe that's $10,000 spread. And so that's a factor that we need to get ahead of. Um, and that's my advice is I have a lot of contacts in HR who will call me and say, hey, what do you think about this? And that's my number one piece of advice right now is get ahead of it. Know that it's coming if it hasn't already happened um, because those early career salaries are going up so rapidly that you really need to have a plan in place for how are you going to manage this and, and what's your philosophy on it? So. Um, but as far as the broader topic of the great resignation, I actually think that if we focus solely on the resignation piece, we're missing a bigger picture. And I really like the term, the great reassessment, because, and Matt, you made this point so well, there are a lot of people who are maybe part of that trend, part of that phenomenon, who aren't quitting, but they're doing some sort of reevaluating. They're maybe negotiating to a different role or different responsibilities or different variety or better work-life balance at their current employer. Sometimes they're quitting. Sometimes they're taking new roles. Um, another trend that I'm seeing a lot is kind of the work pause for many different reasons. It could be uh, kids at home. It could be aging parents. It could be just feeling like I need a break. And for a lot of people, especially more experienced workers who have had some time to build up that 401k, stock market's really good right now. And so they're looking at that 401k and saying, you know, I feel pretty good about where I am. Maybe I'm not ready to retire, but I can take a pause for the next six months and evaluate what I want to do, spend time doing things outside of work that maybe I put off or avoided. So I think it's a much bigger trend. And that's been pretty disruptive in accounting finance, where you've got very structured roles that are calendar driven, uh, where traditionally you've had a long tenure. Um, and now we're seeing dynamics that are really changing that and forcing leaders to look at things much more flexibly, thinking about distributing tasks across their team, cross training, giving people opportunities to participate in special projects. I mean, it's really the ripple effects are huge. As as usual, Ellen, my, my timing was terrible. I actually had such a pause where I took a step back. I, I did some work for my family, a family owned business. I really wish I could have done that during COVID. To be honest with you, my, my timing as usual hadn't hadn't played out uh, as advantageously as I could. Thank you both for adding that uh, or sharing that uh, mm -hmm. that insight there. I do think it's going to be really, really interesting to see how this plays out over the long term. Um, we talked about trends earlier, just kind of a quick question. What workplace trend do you think is all hype and is not going to last? And, and why do you think it's all hype? I would say the remote piece. Um, I have so many conversations where people are just remote, remote, remote. And I think remote is definitely a component, but if you look at survey data, it's not the majority of people who want a 100% remote experience. The majority of people want some kind of mix. They want some in-person time. Maybe it's going into an office a day or two a week. Maybe it's just strategic, intentional in-person time for trainings or a team retreat or whatever it is. But 
I, I think, again, we kind of miss the bigger picture if we focus on remote, remote, remote. And it's really going to be more about flexibility. Steve, the only other thing that I think might be hype that I believe will not last, and frankly, I hope I, it will go away, is so many Zoom meetings. I feel like Zoom and camera was meant to add depth, and it does in some ways, but I actually think it, it, it almost makes a flatter conversation, especially for those things that are a little more routine and mundane, for example, that, hey, a quick phone call could actually do just as well, if not better. So I love it. I absolutely love it. Um, Let's shift to a pretty hot topic right now. Of course, ESG has been a just a huge thing that, that we've been talking a lot about, Rakiva. I know it's on both of your radars as well. I want to talk specifically about DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion, and wondering what your insights are on how accounting and finance leaders uh, are addressing that issue. It is super important. It is critical. I do feel like accounting has lagged uh, a little bit in that regard, particularly um, when it comes to diversity. But just wanting your insights there on how leaders are addressing this issue. Well, I think that it is a struggle. I think many companies do struggle with it. I do think that they are struggling in a somewhat productive manner, and they're trying to struggle with it in a disciplined manner, which is good. And let's not forget that 10 years ago, nobody would even be talking about this really beyond maybe some fluff window dressing. So it's good that we are having these conversations, even if companies are trying to still trying to solve this problem. Um, I also think it kind of depends on the letter we're talking about. If we're really talking about diversity in particular, a big part of that is just recruitment. And I, I have mixed views on how good we are at that. I see so many companies still say that we just can't find enough diverse candidates. And I think that that probably means you are not looking as in as innovative of a way as possible. An awful lot of job descriptions out there are very narrowly tailored and overly engineered. And when you get to that degree of it, you wind up excluding people, not through any overt racism, it's just more like, well, you know, does every single job need to have the exact same industry requirements? Not necessarily. I mean, in sales, you could be a fantastic car salesman and then also sell computer equipment. On the other hand, I, I do think that for diversity, a lot of the accounting firms, especially the big four, they're very thoughtful about this. And let's be honest, they are a pipeline to recruit and train legions of accountants who then wind up in the private sector. So, you know, we're moving in a good direction there. I do think that when you get to the E and the I, a lot of equity and inclusion is about fair treatment of workers. Um, it's about holding managers accountable and maybe some managers are still struggling to accommodate themselves to workplaces that are, you know, frankly, much more respective of women than they had been in the past. Um, so, you know, we're getting there, but there's going to be still an awful lot to do, especially for managers and especially for managers and senior managers who are going to have to hold themselves accountable now for less E and I thoughtful cultures they've had in the past. And I mean, we could quote any number of companies that have gone through that and they're not the last, but that's where we are. Yeah, it makes me think about uh, a phrase that a colleague of mine uses, which is, you know, when you have a talent problem, you have three options, right? You can buy, you can borrow, or you can build. Buy meaning you recruit and hire someone, borrow meaning you leverage a consulting partner or a staffing partner to augment temporarily, and build meaning you train in-house. Uh, and I think the diversity, to Matt's great point, uh, it requires not just lip service, but some action. And that action may require investment, for example, in, on the build piece. If you're not finding people in the marketplace that have the right skills and experience, then really thinking about your campus recruiting program and are you bringing people in uh, that have diverse backgrounds and then providing them training and bringing them up to speed, that, that's an option. It requires effort and investment. Um, and if we're serious about DE&I, then those are the kinds of things we need to be thinking about. So just my overall comment would be, you know, as we have these conversations, um, I really encourage leaders to look at DE&I across that whole spectrum of buy, borrow, and build. Um, and interestingly, RGP, you know, we sit in that borrow space. And one thing that I'm seeing more often than I love is that our clients who have made commitments to DE&I 
they're asking us to be accountable to those same commitments. So for example, I work with our HR team for one of our largest clients to compile a diversity report specific to the RGP team that was serving that client and give them that transparency and visibility into the fact that we were upholding the same commitment to having uh, a really diverse team representative of many viewpoints. The other thing I want to add in terms of equity and inclusion is that I think we've made a lot of progress. We're not there yet, but we've made a lot of progress in bringing diverse perspectives into the workplace. But what we've learned is that those diverse perspectives are only as valuable as the reach that they have. And so it's incumbent upon leaders, not just to bring diversity into the organization, but then commit to sharing those perspectives, making sure that they're heard and broadcast or a, a buzzword might be amplified, right? So making sure that we're capturing those diverse voices and, and amplifying them, not just getting them in the room, uh, but making sure that we're really sharing those ideas. I love it. So moving on to one of the uh, last questions that we've got, wanted to talk about career advancement. I'm certain that's on everybody's mind and we've already shared some reasons as to why that is. But I'm wondering if you could both share some advice and insight on how career advancement has changed as a result of remote work, greater employee control, these other disruptive factors that we've played out, and then maybe how that ought to impact the skills that obviously these employers are looking for, but that we as employees are trying to build. Security. It's not advancement in terms of I'm looking to make a move in my title or my scope or my responsibilities. It was more about uh, that bigger picture of the organization and the feeling of value. And I, I think security is something we could unpack to, to mean a lot of different things. And if I connect those dots to the overall trend of career advancement, you know, traditionally we've had this, you know, you start off as an associate or an analyst and, and then a manager, a senior manager, a director, right, a VP, maybe a partner or CFO. And it's really focused on job titles, size of the team, and scope of responsibilities. And really that career advancement concept is changing to be much more around the projects and initiatives you work on, the skills that you're adding. One thing that I've seen a lot of our clients do that is working really well is when they have a uh, system implementation or a merger integration, rather than engage a big team of consultants to run that project, they're actually pulling their team out of their day-to-day -day work backfilling those day-to-day -day operational accounting or finance roles and putting their team on the project. Not only does it give their team exposure and new skills and experiences, but it also then gives them institutional knowledge going forward, right? And so that employee then becomes that much more valuable because they've got that specialized and technical experience and that institutional knowledge. So I think we really need to rethink the whole idea of what it means to advance. Not everybody wants up. Sometimes people want flexibility or diversity of work, or they want to work with different teams. So really understanding what motivates people and what career advancement looks like to them, uh, I think is where we need to be. I love that thought on the project work, Ellen. Those are some of the best experiences um, I had in accounting and finance. On the upside, you know, accounting and finance are very transferable skills because every business of any significant size, they have an accounting function. They have a finance function. And they're going to be looking for people who can bring certain experience uh, experiences to the job. And so it does become much more about, am I working on the right projects to give me the right skills and, and make the right connections so that I'm always going to be able to find a job and get employed, even if occasionally we hit these career walls, which happened to everybody and it's going to happen to all of us again. Such terrific advice. It is sadly time to wrap up, but we're going to try to have a little fun before we do that. We're going to enter the lightning round. Uh, don't be nervous. Ellen, I'm going to start with you on this question. Is starting your career in public accounting still a great option for people leaving school? Yes. <laughs> That's an easy, easy one, Steve. You're giving me a softball. Um, yes. Here's the comment I would make, and I will make this very quick, um, but it's potentially a little controversial. I think there's such demand in the big four right now for people because they have a lot of demand from their clients. And so that's a place where to use Matt's word, there's a lot of froth. 
And so I think people are uh, entering into those roles with compensation and uh, expectations that are maybe not sustainable in the long term. And so if you think about the traditional career path of kind of proving yourself for a few years in public accounting, maybe staying there, maybe moving into industry, um, I, I think that's going to look a little different. And um, I, I just think we're, it'll be interesting to see how all of that plays out. I totally agree. Matt, anything to add or maybe do you disagree? Uh, no, I don't disagree. I think especially for people at the entry level, public accounting is going to give you a wide range of experience. It's going to introduce you to a large number of uh, people. You'll get a good feel for what you do and don't like more in industries you're working on and problems you're trying to solve. I get it that a lot of the tasks you're going to do, you're probably not going to like. It's not necessarily the sexiest stuff, but there is a reason why it's entry level. Um, and you can put yourself through it for two or three years. Uh, and you know, it's a very good career starter choice. And from there, it opens up a whole lot of other doors later in life. Ellen, I'll direct the next one to you to begin. What's the best piece of career advice you've ever received? So this is not just career advice. I would say it's probably more life advice, but this was from my grandfather. And he said to me, wherever you are now is exactly where you're supposed to be to get where you're going next. And it's a very simple statement, but I found it super powerful throughout my life because the reality is you're often going to be in places that maybe you don't love or aren't quite right. And putting it in that perspective of you are getting something valuable from this experience, it's going to take you to that next place, has just been really, um, it's been kind of a North Star for me. I love it. Matt? Uh, I have always worked on the philosophy of think about what your customer whether those are business customers or your boss or anybody else, but think about what your customer wants you to do right now. Think about what they will probably want you to do 18 months from now. And then think about what they will absolutely insist you be able to do two years from now. And then go and start do that, that third thing. And you will always find that you are going to be one step ahead of what your customers are looking for and uh, then you'll be in a much better employability situation like we discussed earlier. Mm. Two terrific pieces of career advice. Our last question then, Matt, will begin with you. What would you tell your 22-year-old self in hindsight, whether about careers, relationships, or anything else? Oh, I would definitely say, trust your gut when your gut is telling you, no, it's not you. The rest of the world really is crazy. You're right. Trust that. Ellen, we'll give you the last word on this. What would you tell your 22-year-old self? A little patience goes a long way, uh, would have been my advice to myself. I um, Specifically, I got a graduate degree, um, and many people do in, in this field. And uh, I, I wanted that to have, bear fruit for me immediately. And I remember being very down on myself, very hard on myself. Like, gosh, I invested all this time and all this money and trying to get my career to a different place. And I just don't see it happening. And I looked back, you know, two, three years later, and I can see that it did bear that fruit, but it didn't happen overnight. It took some time for me to see that momentum and that change in my career. And that's just one example of, you know, a little patience and a little time. You'll often see things differently. Well, it's a great way to end. Trust your gut, have some patience. I think solid advice across the board, whether it's relationships, career, or anything else. Well, this has been such an awesome discussion. Uh, I can't thank you both enough, Ellen and Matt, for joining us. Definitely want to thank our audience, those who are joining in. We sure appreciate you uh, riding along with us. If you have questions, if you wanna share your thoughts, Please share your comments on the event page and definitely follow or connect with us. We'd love to continue the discussion with you. Again, we want to thank our speakers. We want to thank our audience. Thank you all for such a wonderful discussion. We hope you have a great day.